Hello, my name is Jaru. Today, I'm talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. This video is the third in a series, so I highly recommend you check out my previous videos in order to get some important context. Today, I will be discussing Deltarune's magic. However, before I get into that, I need to emphasize that this video will be a tad different from my last two videos. You see, we have so little information about Deltarune's magic that it's almost impossible to make any concrete deductions about how it works. As a result, it's hard to have a meaningful discussion about this topic, which is quite different from my other videos. When I discussed whether Deltarune was an alternate reality or an alternate timeline, we obviously had no definitive answer, but we did have enough evidence to build some interesting theories for us to discuss. Even without a concrete answer, this topic still provides ample room for discussion. Similarly, we don't know who Chris really is, but we have enough evidence that we can have a fun time coming up with theories and debating them. We don't have definitive answers for either of these questions, but we have enough evidence to produce educated guesses that are fun to discuss. The same cannot be said for today's topic. There is so little evidence about Deltarune's magic that it's almost impossible to build a convincing argument that doesn't sound far-fetched. There are theories that I've seen regarding the nature of Deltarune's magic, and I will be discussing the more popular of those theories in this video, but that's not what the main focus is going to be. Today's video will mostly consist of my personal theory regarding what I think is going on with Deltarune's magic. But, since there's so little evidence for me to work with, this theory of mine is basically going to be a shot in the dark there's a good chance that my theory is completely wrong, as I built this theory using very little evidence and a number of major assumptions. You'll understand what I mean when I get to it. But for now, just try and keep in mind that this theory is not me giving a concrete hypothesis based on confident facts. This is a crackpot tinfoil hat conspiracy theory that is almost certainly wrong. So. Don't get your hopes too high. With that disclaimer out there, let's actually start discussing Deltarune's magic. Now, for starters, let's have some background on magic. In Undertale, monsters were literally made of magic, and as a result, each and every monster could wield magic to some extent. They could use it to make weapons, they could use it to heal wounds, and they could use it to power their technology. Humans, on the other hand, were made mostly of water, and thus did not have the natural ability to wield magic the way the monsters could. It's said that the magicians that sealed the monsters underground used a magic spell. However, this seems to contradict what the book in the library says. As such, either they were mistaken and the humans actually used soul power, aka determination, to create the barrier, or the book in the library just meant that humans do not naturally have the ability to wield magic. Perhaps it's possible for a human to learn magic even though they're not born with it. Whatever the case, it seems that most humans do not have magic, as opposed to monsters who can all use magic. Now, let's compare that to Deltarune. If Deltarune is an alternate reality, then we really have no way of knowing what the rules of magic are in this universe, which would make this video almost entirely pointless. As such, we will instead be assuming that Deltarune is an alternate timeline, as that at least gives us a little bit more to discuss. In this timeline, there is no evidence of any of these monsters wielding magic in the light world. Caddy is the only character who even brings up the concept of magic when she talks about studying the occult with Chris and teaching Noel some spells. However, this is literally the only time that magic ever comes up in the light world, and Caddy never actually uses any of her supposed magic. 
Furthermore, none of the returning characters from Undertale are ever seen using magic either. Undyne never summons energy spears, despite that being something that she was quite fond of doing in Undertale. Toriel no longer seems to use magic, as her stove is all messy, which is different from Undertale, where her stove was always clean thanks to her using fire magic. Furthermore, Toriel had healing magic in Undertale that she used to heal Frisk, and yet Chris wears a bandage. If Chris's mother had healing magic, wouldn't she use it on her injured child? The fact that Chris wears such a bandage seems to imply that Toriel simply does not have healing magic. Similarly, if healing magic was a thing that existed, then why would these monsters need to rest in the hospital to recover from their injuries? Rudy might make sense, as it's possible that whatever illness he has is too complex to be fixed with simple healing magic. But it doesn't make sense for these other guys. The fact that they have to use bandages and spend time recovering seems to imply that they can't just use healing magic. Then there's Noelle. At the end of Chapter 2, she seems to imply that magic, or at least healing magic, does not exist in the Light World, when she says that she prefers the Dark World, where everything can be healed with a little spell. And then there's the matter of monster biology. Remember, monsters are literally made of magic, which is why in Undertale, monsters turned into dust upon dying, as they didn't actually have much of a physical body in the first place. As such, at monster funerals, they have no body to bury, so instead they sprinkle the dust on that person's favorite object. All of this seems to still be true in Deltarune. When talking to Father Alvin in the cemetery, he talks about how they buried his father's hammer in this grave. He does not say that they buried his father here. This seems to suggest that monsters still turn into dust upon death. After all, why would they still have this tradition of burying a monster's favorite object in a reality where they still have the body? The whole point of burying the person's favorite object was because they don't have a body to bury. And if you want to argue that they bury the body and the person's favorite object, doesn't it seem strange that Father Alvin only mentions burying the hammer? Furthermore, why would the tombstones all have pictures of objects on them and have descriptions specifically mentioning what object was used while having zero mention of the monster's body? It really only makes sense if they don't have a body to bury due to monsters still turning into dust. Birdley's death may seem to contradict this, but for one, he died in the Dark World, and it's clear that the rules of the Dark and Light worlds operate differently. It's possible dying in the Dark World simply makes you brain dead in the Light World. But even if that wasn't the case, in Undertale, monsters who died of natural causes did not instantly disintegrate. They would enter a comatose state called falling down, which is how Alphys was able to collect their bodies and use them in her experiments. As such, it stands to reason that Birdly would enter this fallen down state for a while before disintegrating. I suspect they'll hint at this in a later chapter. Remember how Chris stole all those items from the computer lab in order to bring them to the castle town? I wouldn't be surprised if we get a line of dialogue from someone in Chapter 3 mentioning that someone stole stuff from the library. And if you play Chapter 3 after killing Birdly, they'll probably have an extra line of dialogue talking about finding dust in the computer lab. But I digress. More importantly, when talking to this little rabbit monster, they ask Chris what it's like to be made of blood. This question pretty much confirms that monsters are still not made of blood, just like in Undertale, as it doesn't really make much sense for the monster to ask this question otherwise. They also have a follow-up question asking about human skeletons, which suggests monsters also don't have skeletons, which only further supports the notion that monsters are still mostly made of magic. I should also point out that Susie has a line where she says that, quote, 
everybody bleeds, which might seem to contradict this line from the rabbit monster. However, upon closer inspection, I don't think they contradict each other. The rabbit says humans are made of blood, and Susie says everybody bleeds, but she does not say that everybody has blood. It's quite possible that monsters also bleed, but instead of bleeding blood, they just bleed something else. Even if we ignore Sans, who definitely bleeds, we know that monsters are capable of sweating. So why wouldn't they also be capable of bleeding? They clearly have some sort of liquid inside of them. When we wound characters like Toriel and Undyne, they don't seem to bleed, but maybe that's because whatever liquid they have inside them is super viscous, like maple syrup, and so the monster ends up turning to dust before their liquids can emerge from their wounds. Or maybe we can't see them bleeding because their liquid is pitch black, and thus it blends in with the background. Or maybe Susie was just wrong. She's not exactly the most educated person after all. My point being that there are plenty of ways to interpret these two lines and they don't necessarily contradict each other. Also, skeletons, ghosts, and fire elementals all still exist in Deltarune, and those are all extremely magical entities. As such, it seems like magic does still exist in some form in this timeline, if only as a function of monster biology. So, how should we interpret all of this? If Deltarune was an alternate reality, then we could simply hand wave all this and just say that magic works differently in this reality. But since we're assuming that Deltarune is an alternate timeline, we need to explain these discrepancies. Monsters still have magical biology, but they don't seem to use their magic to cast spells. So how could we explain that? Well, before we get to my interpretation, let's talk about some of the most popular theories that you guys brought up in the comments section of my previous videos. The first and most popular theory is that magic is the same as it was in Undertale, and that monsters just stopped using magic over time due to them having access to modern technology. They could cast magic if they wanted to, like Caddy supposedly does, but they just don't bother because they have technology. I was quite surprised how popular this theory was in the comments, and people even had a few variations on it. Some argued that the war not happening meant that the monsters just stopped teaching their children about magic because they wouldn't have need for those skills anymore. Some argued that the monsters became so dependent on technology that evolution just made them lose access to magic. Some argue that magic still exists and is still used, but that certain types of magic died out, like healing magic. Maybe they stopped bothering with healing magic because they had modern medicine. Now, these are all perfectly valid interpretations, and they may even be true. However, I personally find this argument rather hard to believe. Magic is so versatile and so useful that I just can't imagine the monsters would stop using it. In Undertale, the monsters kept using magic even after gaining access to modern technology. In fact, they actually combined science and magic to create brand new magical technology such as the core. I feel like in a timeline where humans and monsters live in peace, they'd be much more likely to combine magic with technology than they would be to just abandon magic altogether. The second most popular theory in the comments was the idea that magic still exists, but that the monsters specifically gave up their magic as a part of the peace deal that they made with the humans during the war. This argument holds that the reason the war ended peacefully and the monsters got to keep living on the surface was because the monsters somehow gave up their magical powers. Exactly how they managed to get rid of their own magic, I don't know, but I do find this theory at least a little bit more feasible. 
Monsters giving up their magic to save their species seems a lot more plausible than the monsters just not bothering with magic anymore because they have technology. However, I do have issues with this theory as well. We have no idea if it's even possible for the monsters to get rid of their magic, especially considering that magic is still clearly part of their biology, and it doesn't explain why the monsters gain their magic right back when they enter the Dark World. The other issue is that the main threat that caused the war was the fact that humans were scared of the monsters' ability to absorb human souls. It wasn't their magic that humans were scared of, so why would humanity insist on the monsters getting rid of their magic? In fact, why does this book in the library that talks about souls say nothing about this entire issue? But perhaps more importantly, why does nobody in Deltarune talk about any of this? Why does everybody in town act like magic just doesn't exist? Why would Caddy talk about casting spells if every monster's magic had been sealed away? Wouldn't that mean Caddy is violating the deal they made with humanity? Or is Caddy just lying and she doesn't actually know how to use magic? When Chris looked up how to use magic on the internet, why was the top search result a book on juggling and tricks? If magic is a real thing in this world, shouldn't the top result be a book on actual magic? Shouldn't there be a book in the library about the history of magic? Shouldn't that be something that Father Alvin talks about? You'd think that magic being real would have some relevancy in their religion. So. While I think this theory has some merits, and it could still be true, I personally think there's just too many holes for it to entirely make sense. So that brings us to my interpretation. I do not believe that magic spells exist in the light world at all. I think it is completely gone from this realm. There is no healing magic, there is no fire magic, there is no magical electricity, and there is no magical energy spears. I think Caddy is just meant to be a moody, goth teenager who studies the occult to be edgy and counterculture, and not because magic actually exists. I think Toby Fox gave the only lines about magic in the entire light world to Caddy specifically so that way we would know that magic is not a legitimate thing. I think there is biological magic that keeps the monsters alive, but that's it. I think all other magic has been completely erased from the light world. This leads us to an important question. How on earth could someone erase magic from the world? How could they alter such a fundamental part of nature? And more importantly, why does nobody talk about it? Why does everybody act like magic never existed? Why does it seem like everyone's memories of magic have been erased? Well, there is one source of power that has demonstrated the ability to do all of this. A source of power that allows you to rewrite reality, erase people's memories, and influence alternate timelines. A source of power that was reintroduced in Chapter 2 of Deltarune. I am of course referring to Determination. In Undertale, we see Frisk use determination to accomplish most of the things we just mentioned. By using their save and load powers, Frisk is able to rewrite reality. Specifically, they use it to restore reality to a previous state. And to be clear, saving and loading is not time travel. At least, it's not time travel as you would normally imagine it. Frisk is not going back in time. There's not a second Frisk that you encounter when you load your save file. If they were going back in time, then that would completely undo all of the things that you did. For example, if you met Undyne and then loaded your save file at a point prior to meeting her, you wouldn't be erasing her memories, you would be preventing her memories from being created in the first place by going back in time. 
But that's not how it works. If you befriend Undyne, load your save file, and then talk to her again, she'll have brand new dialogue where she talks about how familiar this all is, and she feels a warmth towards Frisk. And this little detail is not unique to her. Most of the main characters have unique dialogue if you befriend them and then reset. If saving and loading was just time travel, how could they remember you? Simple. You're not time traveling. You are rewriting reality. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle that hadn't been assembled yet. If you assembled that puzzle and then took it apart, would you be going back in time to before it was assembled? Of course not. You're just rearranging the pieces. That is how saving and loading works. You're not rewinding time, you're just rearranging the pieces that make up the universe back into a previous shape. That's why characters feel deja vu when they meet Frisk a second time. You didn't erase the fact that you met them. That meeting still happened. You just took away their memories of it happening. Azrael uses this power against you in the final battle, as he erases the memories of your friends and has them fight you. However, even though their memories have been erased, some part of their soul still remembers you. Some part of their soul, perhaps due to their own determination, is protected from Azrael's influence. As a result, Frisk is able to restore their memories. However, while Frisk is able to rewrite reality and erase people's memories, we never see them do anything as profound as erasing magic itself from the world. And Frisk is the most powerful wielder of determination that we encounter, so if they couldn't erase magic from the world, then who could? Well, while Frisk may be the most powerful individual wielder of determination, there is one entity that managed to surpass Frisk by stealing other people's determination. I am of course referring to the hyper god of death himself, Asriel Dreamer. By absorbing the souls of everyone in the underground, Asriel ascended to godhood and gained infinite power in the process. He is powerful enough to obliterate timelines and destroy the world. And like I said earlier, he used his powers to directly erase people's memories. With power like that, it seems likely that he would be capable of erasing or altering the magic in the world if he so chose. And what's interesting about this is that, in theory, any monster could ascend to godhood if they were willing to kill and absorb the souls of seven humans. And to be clear, absorbing human souls grants monsters so much power precisely because of the determination within those souls. That is the power that is so devastating. So, with Asriel as an example, we now have an already established plot device that could answer the mystery of Deltarune's magic. As such, I'm going to tell you a story. The story that I believe is the true backstory of the Deltarune timeline. Afterwards, I'll elaborate on my specific deductions in greater depth, but I thought it would be fun to do a little bit of theatrics to start us off. Long ago, two races ruled over Earth. Humans and monsters. One day, war broke out between the two races. Why did the humans attack? Indeed, it seemed that they had nothing to fear. Humans are unbelievably strong. It would take the soul of nearly every monster just to equal the power of a single human soul. But humans have one weakness. Ironically, it is the strength of their soul. Its power allows it to persist outside of the human body, even after death. If a monster defeats a human, they can take its soul. A monster with a human soul, a horrible beast with unfathomable power. And so it was. Whether through luck or fate, a monster did indeed acquire a human soul during this war. And so, 
a terrible beast was born with that first soul claimed it was easy for the beast to slay a second human and then more by the time the beast had claimed seven human souls, its power had transcended mortal comprehension. It was akin to a god. With this power, all of time and space were beholden to it. Nothing was beyond its sight. It could see the future of humans and monsters, and it was grim. So long as humans feared monsters, there would be endless conflict and misery. The beast could destroy humanity with a thought, if it so desired. But the beast knew the humans acted out of fear, not malice. The fear of humanity was rooted in their fear of the supernatural powers the monsters possessed this magic that humanity could never wield. And so, the beast made a choice. Reaching its long hand to the sky, it coursed its will into its blade, and it split the world in two. In one world, the humans and monsters would live in the light of peace, with no fear or memory of the magic that once plagued them. And in the other world, this magic would be sealed away, hidden in darkness forevermore. Never again would monsters wield magic, and never again would humanity fear it. Or so the beast had hoped. Despite all its awesome power, there were still things the beast could not control. Even after the beast erased their memories of magic, the monsters still felt the echo of their lost power, and the humans still felt the echo of their fear. The beast, its eyes seeing beyond time, knew that the mortals would inevitably go searching for this dark world of magic. They would cut through the barrier between light and dark and see what they had forgotten. The monsters would regain their lost magic and would wield it with ease and joy, as was their birthright. And the humans, seeing they could still not wield this magic, would grow bitter and afraid once again. The beast, seeing no permanent solution, devised one final plan. When the time came and the barrier between light and dark was shattered, the beast would return and it would reset everything back to zero. Everyone's memories, everyone's choices, it would all be undone, and the world would be restored to how it was before the balance of light and dark was broken. The price for heaven on earth was steep, but it was a price the beast was willing to pay. And so it waits to this very day, slumbering in a dark dream until its time has come to awaken. This terrible beast, a monster wielding the power of a god, a bridge between earth and heaven, a titan, or perhaps a better term would be an angel. Or at least, that's my interpretation. So let's discuss why exactly I believe this is the true backstory of Deltarune. Let's start with the Angel. As it stands, the only entity capable of erasing everyone's memories, reshaping the timeline, and altering magic itself is a god akin to Asriel. It's generally believed that the Angel from the prophecy in Undertale is Asriel, at least in the true pacifist route. As such, the fact that Ral Say directly brings up the angel in his prophecy and discusses something called the angel's heaven seems like direct confirmation that we will be dealing with another god at some point in this timeline. And unlike in Undertale, where the role of the angel is somewhat ambiguous, Rousey's prophecy very clearly presents the angel in an antagonistic role. Hence my presentation of this entity as morally dubious. 
Furthermore, in Undertale, Gerson specifically mentions the idea that the winged entity featured in the Deltarune is believed to be the angel. Since the game Deltarune is literally named after this symbol, it seems certain that the angel will make an appearance in the plot. The most likely time period for when such a god could be born would be in the war, as that would provide ample opportunity for the monsters to acquire a human soul. That said, due to the timeline-altering powers that a god can wield, it's also entirely possible that this god came into existence later on in the timeline. Maybe some alternate version of Asriel actually followed through on his promise. He did say that he would reset everything and erase everyone's memories. Maybe Deltarune is a timeline where he actually did it. That would explain why the theme of this game is, your choices don't matter. I think that Deltarune will end with the characters realizing they're stuck in a time loop, only for the angel to pop out, erase everyone's memories, and reset the universe back to how it was at the start of chapter one. Although, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Point is, there are ample opportunities for a god like Azrael to be spawned. And with limitless power over reality, it's safe to say that such a god would see that the crux of the conflicts between humans and monsters is the human's fear. Of course, the humans in Undertale were specifically afraid of the monster's ability to absorb human souls, but it's safe to say that we could group that fear together with their fear of magic. After all, absorbing souls and becoming a god is pretty magical, and since these humans were likely from an extremely primitive civilization, it's fair to guess that they would not distinguish between soul-stealing and magic. Even the ancient runes that we read in Undertale refer to the barrier as being created by a magic spell, despite modern monsters knowing that humans can't use magic. This implies that even the monsters at the time didn't know the difference between soul power and magic power. That said, monsters also say that them being made of magic makes them more attuned to their soul, which suggests that magic and souls have more ties to one another than we currently understand. Regardless of the exact logic involved, a god would be the only entity capable of eliminating magic, and thus there must be some reason for the god to do such a thing. A monster getting rid of magic in order to bring about peace between humans and monsters seems as likely a reason as any other option. This leads to the next point in my interpretation, the idea that the Dark World is a world that the Angel created as a place to seal away magic. I have a couple of reasons for believing this is the case. For one, every single monster who has come to the Dark World has instantly and easily managed to wield magic in some form or another. They didn't get a tutorial, they didn't get training, they just instantly knew how to use magic. Susie can fire energy blasts, Noelle can pacify, heal, and cast ice magic, and Birdly can summon a halberd made of energy in a method that is very reminiscent of what Undyne does. In Undertale, all monsters can wield magic. It is part of their very biology, and so they can wield it without even trying. It's how they express themselves. Even the children can wield magic. As such, if the monsters in Deltarune once had the ability to wield magic, but then had it taken away from them, then it would make perfect sense for them to instantly know how to use magic upon entering the Dark World. It's pure instinct for them, as it's part of their biology. This leads into my next point. The fact that Chris is unable to use magic. It is specifically pointed out in Chapter 2 that Chris has shown an interest in learning magic, and it's later mentioned that they used to study magic with Caddy. However, even after entering the Dark World, and despite being a Lightner, Chris still cannot wield magic. When you look in the description of Chris's abilities and look at the Act command, it specifically mentions that this is not magic. Now, why would Toby Fox feel the need to point this out? 
I believe it's to draw attention to the fact that Chris, despite very much wanting to wield magic, cannot. I think Rousey is also aware of this, as he is opposed to Susie acting due to that being the only unique thing Chris can do. And the only reason Chris can't use magic, based off the evidence we've seen, is that Chris is a human. And as we learned in Undertale, humans will never know the joy of using magic. If the Dark World was just a generic fantasy land where your dreams are made into reality, then Chris should be able to use magic. But the fact that Chris cannot, and the fact that the game repeatedly draws attention to this fact, makes it pretty clear that this is an important plot point. It's showing that Deltarune and Undertale still follow extremely similar rules regarding the mechanics of magic in their world. If Deltarune was an alternate reality with no connection to Undertale, then it would be rather strange to insist on the magic continuing to follow the same rules. Which means, you guessed it, I think the lack of magic in the Light World and the fact that it continues to follow Undertale rules in the Dark World is more evidence that this universe is tied to Undertale in some core way. But wait, there's more. All of the evidence I have discussed thus far pales in comparison to what I'm going to discuss next. There was one line of dialogue that instantly caught my eye in Chapter 2 of Deltarune. A line of dialogue that is responsible for me finally piecing all this evidence together. A line of dialogue that seems to directly confirm my theory. And it comes from none other than the big shot himself, Spamton. Much like Jevil from Chapter 1, Spamton seems to have been cursed with forbidden knowledge. He was given a peek behind the curtain of reality and saw dark truths that revealed something horrifying. What truth did he see? Well, I believe he saw the dark reality of the angel. He saw that his life was a lie and that nothing he did mattered as his whole world would inevitably get reset by the angel. When Jevil saw this horrible truth, he accepted it and took it as permission to behave however he wanted. He could kill everyone, and it wouldn't matter because the angel would bring them all back when it reset the timeline. Spamton, on the other hand, did not take this revelation very well at all. In fact, it seemed to completely shatter his mind. Spamton desperately searched for the power to resist this horrible fate, and when he got his hands on a lightener, he thought his chance had finally come. He needed the same power that the angel wielded, the power to change fate, the power of determination, the power of souls. If he could just claim a human soul, then maybe he could rise above the terrible darkness created by the angel. Maybe he too could become a god. With a human soul, maybe he could escape this terrible fate and, as he puts it, see into heaven. Recall that Spamton directly asks if heaven is watching. He says it in an almost taunting manner. Who else could he be taunting in heaven if not the angel? But that's not even the spiciest part. The line of dialogue that helped me piece all this together only shows up in one specific scene. If you complete the weird route, aka the Snowgrave route, and fight Spamton alone, something extremely interesting happens. Chris calls for help from Rousey and Susie, the two members of Chris's party who can wield magic. And what is Spamton's response to this? You think you can beat me with your friend's magic? Go ahead, kid. Call all you want. No one will ever pick up. There will be no more miracles. No more magic. You lost it when you tried to see too far. You lost it. 
Hmm. We lost our magic, eh? As in, we had magic at some point, but lost it, eh? As in, we lost it as a result of trying to see too far. As in, see into heaven, like you want to do? Hmm? In case it wasn't clear, it seems pretty evident that, as far as Spamton's understanding of the events are concerned, the Lightners had magic, they then tried to see into heaven, and as a direct consequence of that, they lost their magic. In other words, this sounds like Spamton is directly stating that the Lightners either created the angel or woke up the angel, and as a result, the angel took their magic away. The fact that the one saying this is Spamton, a character who clearly has a far greater understanding of the plot than almost anyone, and who constantly speaks in riddles that hint at the greater narrative, only further convinces me that my theory is right. Honestly, I think this one line might be the single most important line in the first two chapters of Deltarune. But there's still something else that I haven't discussed yet. The idea that the angel is responsible for splitting the world into a light world and a dark world. Why do I think this is the case? Well, when the angel took away everyone's magic, I think it couldn't just destroy the magic. I think it had to seal the magic away somewhere else. And so, it used its powers to create a second layer of reality. In this lair, the angel would hide all the magic. The angel then created a barrier of sorts that keeps the light world and the dark world separated. A barrier that keeps the magic trapped on the other side. I think this barrier is made out of determination, much like the barrier in Undertale, which is why you need determination in order to puncture a hole in this barrier. I think the roaring is what happens when you poke too many holes and collapse the barrier. I think the roaring is bad because when the barrier collapses, the light world and the dark world slam together and magic floods back into the world, presumably causing a lot of chaos in the process. To put it another way, the dark world is like a balloon filled with water. Poke a hole in that balloon, and the water starts leaking out. That's how dark fountains grant magic to monsters so long as they're near the dark fountain. They're literally being washed in pure magic. And if you poke too many holes in that water balloon, then the whole thing pops. I think it's quite revealing that Chris is the only one capable of sealing dark fountains. I think it's because this barrier is made out of pure determination. And thus, in order to repair a hole in that barrier, you need to fill it with more determination. As such, only a human wielding a great deal of determination is capable of repairing such a hole. It may be that anyone, even a monster with a tiny amount of determination, can poke a hole in this barrier, but only someone with a great deal of determination can repair such a hole. After all, anyone can poke a hole in a balloon, but it's much harder to repair such a hole. And lastly, I think this interpretation makes a lot of sense when it comes to the main theme of Deltarune. Like I mentioned earlier, I think that Deltarune will end with the characters realizing they're stuck in a time loop only for the angel to reset everything back to how it was at the start of chapter 1. That would explain what Toby Fox meant when he said that while there's only one ending, there are more important things than reaching the end. It's like Ralsei said, the way we treat people makes all the difference. Even if everything gets reset at the end, whether we choose to be kind or cruel will define our experience with this game and this world. 
If Undertale is a game all about emphasizing how important your decisions are and how impactful they can be on the world, then I think Deltarune is a game about finding meaning in a world where your choices don't matter. In a world where your choices will all be undone and you cannot change the outcome for anyone, what meaning does your life have? If everyone's destiny has already been written and nothing you do can change that, then what is the purpose of your existence? How should you behave in a world where nothing you do matters? I think the role of the secret bosses in this game is to show us different ways people can respond to this very question. When Jevil was asked this question, his response was that his purpose was to have as much fun as possible. He chose hedonism, prioritizing his own pleasure over everything else. When Spamton was asked this question, it broke him and he lived in denial while desperately trying to defy his destiny. When Ralsei is inevitably asked this question, he will likely say that you should still be kind to everyone. Because even if the ending won't change, how you treat others is what defines your life. Susie will almost certainly rebel against having a set destiny. Although whether this revelation breaks her the way it broke Spamton, I cannot say. I think this concept would be a fantastic core theme for Deltarune to have, as it's totally up Toby Fox's alley to make it the core theme, as this is a question that is extremely applicable to real life. In real life, there is also only one ending for all of us. No matter what choices we make over the course of our lives, we will all face the same inevitable end. As such, if our choices don't change the outcome, then how should we live our lives? Should we only pursue pleasure like Jevil? Should we try and defy destiny and try to become immortal like Spamton? Should we continue to act kind towards others like Rousey? Or is it a different answer altogether? Considering we have five more chapters to go, I expect that Toby Fox will be giving us several other possible answers to this question. This theme and this question is so fascinating and philosophical, and it works so well for Deltarune and Toby Fox that it just makes me feel even more like my theory might actually be correct. In summary, my current theory is that Deltarune truly is an alternate timeline, and that the lack of magic was directly caused by the angel from the prophecy taking away the monster's magic. Why it did this is debatable, but I suspect it was done out of a desire to preserve the peace between humans and monsters. I think the subtle lines of dialogue from this rabbit monster and from Father Alvin are sufficient evidence to confirm that monsters are still made out of magic. The existence of blatantly supernatural entities like skeletons, ghosts, and fire elementals also further supports this idea. I think the mechanics of magic in the Dark World are far too reminiscent of Undertale to be a coincidence, and I think the monsters suddenly gaining access to magic upon getting close to a dark fountain proves that there is something inherently magical about these fountains. I think the extreme emphasis on magic being important to Chris is very much a major plot point, and given how important the angel clearly is for the plot of Deltarune, and considering that the angel is the only entity who could conceivably take away magic from the world, I think these two concepts are very intentionally connected to one another. I think the barrier between the light world and the dark world is made out of soul power or determination, and that a dark fountain is what is created when you use determination to punch a hole in this barrier. I think Spamton and Jevil were driven to madness and hedonism as a direct result of realizing that the angel was inevitably going to reset this timeline. 
And lastly, I think the idea of the angel resetting the timeline at the end of Deltarune works perfectly with the main theme of this game being that your choices don't matter. To reduce my theory to a single sentence, I believe that the angel created the Dark World to seal away magic, and that the end of Deltarune will be caused by the Dark World collapsing, magic returning to the world, and the angel resetting the timeline. Now, is this theory airtight and completely supported by the facts? Almost certainly not. Like I said at the start of this video, this theory is a wild shot in the dark. I took the few puzzle pieces we had, jammed them together, and am presenting what I think those puzzle pieces might reveal. I feel very confident in this theory, but I am fully aware that this theory is built on an extremely flimsy foundation. Not only am I making a ton of assumptions about the nature of Deltarune and how it is connected to Undertale, but I am then building a theory on top of those assumptions using barely any evidence. To put it another way, I am attempting to predict the entire plot of Deltarune when I can't even prove something as simple as whether it takes place in an alternate timeline or an alternate reality. So. Make no mistake, I am fully aware that my theory is basically just a wild guess. That said, do I think my theory might be correct? Of course I do. I wouldn't make a whole video about this theory if I didn't think it had some merit. Plus, imagine if I was right. Imagine if I managed to guess the core conflict and ending of Deltarune when we barely have any evidence to work with. I would never stop being proud of myself. I would be flexing about my galaxy brain until the day I die. So I had to get my theory out there just in case it turns out to be true. That said, I'm more than happy to accept alternative theories and interpretations, as my theory is basically just wild speculation. So, do you guys see any major flaws in my theory? Do you have alternative interpretations of the evidence I discussed? If my theory is wrong, what do you think happened to Deltarune's magic? What do you think the final conflict of the game will be? If the theme of this game is about how your choices don't matter, how do you think Toby Fox will expand upon that theme in later chapters? I would love to hear your answers to all of these questions. But before I wrap this video up, I figure I'd go ahead and throw out some additional bits of speculation that are connected to my theory, but that I couldn't find a convenient way to integrate into my script. For one, I suspect that Gaster was likely the one that revealed to Spamton and Jevil what the angel planned to do. Jevil met a strange someone, and the person that Spamton talked to left nothing but garbage noise on their phone, which is a concept associated with Gaster. Gaster was shattered across all of time and space, so it makes sense that he would notice the angel resetting the timeline. I suspect that Rao Se somehow has memories or deja vu of the previous timelines, and that is how he knows about the Roaring. I suspect that the Roaring, like many of you have suggested, has indeed happened before. It has likely happened many times, and the Angel just reset the timeline every time it occurred. I think that is how Rao Se knows about it. I think his prophecy might just be his own memories of previous timelines. How exactly he retained his memories after the timeline reset, I don't know. Also, I think it's possible that these shadow crystals that you receive from Jevil and Spamton are actually granting you glimpses of previous timelines. That's why they always seem to show you things from the past. For example, it shows Susie glaring at Chris, just like she had been in Chapter 1. Additionally, I don't think the angel is Asriel in this timeline. That would be retreading old ground, and I think Toby Fox would prefer to show us what it's like when someone other than Asriel gets a hold of godlike power. 
Who the angel really is, I'm not sure. I bet it will be someone we know, as that would have more dramatic weight, but who exactly it is, I have no idea. And lastly, I think the idea of the angel taking away everyone's memories is directly tied to the song, Don't Forget. I think these lyrics are describing what our heroes are doing at the end of the world. They know what the angel is going to do, and they know they can't stop it. So, they make a promise. A promise that they will keep deep inside their soul, where the angel cannot reach it. A promise to not forget each other. A promise to remember that no matter what happens, no matter what the angel does to their memories, the truth is that their time together really happened, and that's something the angel can never take away. Darkness may consume your memories, your world, and even your very soul, but even then, your friends are still with you in that darkness. And with that, I think I'll wrap up today's video here. I know this is a lot shorter than my previous video, which is a shame considering how important I think this theory is for understanding the true story of Deltarune, but there's not much more for me to say. Unlike with the debate surrounding Chris's true identity, we don't have nearly as much evidence to discuss when it comes to figuring out Deltarune's magic. But don't be too disappointed, because I've got something special to discuss in the next video. Not only will my next video likely be quite long, but it will be discussing what I suspect is the most important mystery in Deltarune. Next time, I will be discussing the true nature of Ralph Say. I will go over the most common theories while also giving my thoughts on what I believe is his true origin. And spoiler alert, my Ralsei theory is one that I've never seen anywhere else before, so you might be surprised by what I have to say. The secret of Ralsei, I believe, is the emotional heart of this story. And with that, I'll see you guys next time. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you've got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.